Welcome. Thanks to Avemco for sponsoring this series of webinars. Also to my colleague, Lane Lisser, who you see on the screen there, who helped uh, with all the webinars in the series, but has a larger role today. Lane experienced an in-flight engine failure in his Kristen Eagle a few years ago, and today he will tell us the whole story, and we will relate the decisions he had to make back to our discussions, uh, our, decision, our discussions today about decision-making. All right. In case you didn't know, Avemco is a sponsor of the FAST team and pays for the wings that we receive when we complete a phase of wings. At the end of this presentation, I will tell you how you might be eligible for a discount on your aircraft insurance for attending this webinar, so stay tuned. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping first. When we're live on site, we tell you where the bathrooms are and where the emergency exits are. We'll leave that up to you. Our emergency today would be some sort of a system crash uh, on my end. It's unlikely, uh, but if it does happen, uh, check your email and also check the vectorsforsafety.com website for information, and we will schedule to try again. Uh, since my picture's there, I'm going to go and turn my webcam off at this point. Try to. Hmm. Stop sharing webcam. There we go. It did actually go off. Okay. Um, anyway, this is me. For the benefit of those who, of you who have not participated in any of my events previously, a very brief introduction. My whole life has revolved around aviation. I took my first official flying lesson at the age of 14, so old on my 16th birthday. Uh, that was way back in 1962, so you can do the math on how old I am. I had a great career. Very, very thankful for that. Uh, I have airline experience and business aviation experience. Uh, for me, flight instructing uh, was never just a means to build flight time, but it was a calling. I've given more than 8,000 hours of dual instruction. I've continued with my psychology background to do work in human factors, and today um, developing ways to reduce human error is my passion. So in addition to aviation, I do error reduction and uh, consulting work for a number of, uh, of industries and a number of companies. I have two websites there, uh, vectorsforsafety.com and genebenson.com. The vectorsforsafety.com is a new website uh, that we put up within the last month, I guess. Um, everything used to be on my website, and we, Vector sort of outgrew that, so we have a new one. So uh, check everything out there. We named it after the newsletter, which we call Vectors for Safety, and you can sign up for that free newsletter from that website. And if you want to email me, it's gene at genebenson.com. All right, and uh, here is Wayne with his Kristen Eagle. He competes in aerobatics and has more than 1,000 hours of flight time, with the majority of it being in his Eagle. We will hear from Wayne a little bit later as he tells us about his adventure with an engine coming apart in flight. So let's begin. Uh, there's more than one way to categorize, uh, this, yeah, categorize, there we go, decision making. But this is the way I present it to pilots. There are three kinds of decisions. Now, not all psychologists agree on the terminology or the taxonomy, but here is what I believe to be the best way to look at decision making from the perspective of the pilot. Analytical decision making is the branch in which we have enough time to ponder our decision. The second branch is what I call rapid decision making. I prefer to think of rapid uh, uh, decision making as being concerned with solving a problem that allows us a short but reasonable amount of time. Finally, we have what I call urgent decision making. That would be when we must uh, make an immediate or a nearly immediate response. Let's look at a quick overview of these. Some examples of aeronautical decision making might be deciding to join a flying club or whether to pursue an additional rating. Some examples of rapid decision making might be engine failure at 5,000 feet above the ground in clear weather in an airplane that has a reasonable glide capability, or maybe an alternator failure while on IMC. We have a little bit of time that we can work those problems out. And then some examples of urgent decision making might be uh, engine failure at 100 feet above the ground on initial climb, or maybe flames suddenly appearing from under the panel. Now let's look at each kind of decision making in more detail. Take a little deeper look into analytical decision making. The key base word here is analyze. We have ample time to consider our options. We may have hours, days, or longer. 
We have some tools to help us with our analytical decision making, but they sometimes can be a bit flawed. One of those tools is the risk assessment matrix. I'm sure you've all seen this before. So let's look at two examples. First, take the case of a pilot who is planning a flight over mountainous terrain and the weather forecast mentions the possibility of severe turbulence. So our pilot estimates that the likelihood of actually encountering the condition is occasional. The pilot also knows though that the severity of the consequences of the rotor clouds and the severe turbulence is critical. The risk therefore falls into the yellow oops yep <laughs> falls into the uh, yellow or the serious uh, risk category. Now in theory at least the pilot can make an informed decision as to whether or not to begin the flight. But can that pilot really make a good decision? We'll get there. There we go. Let's say the pilot has just had a weekend away with a spouse and two kids. It's Sunday afternoon. The pilot and the pilot's spouse both have jobs, and they both have important meetings on Monday morning. Social distancing, of course, I guess. One of the kids is in high school and is to begin state-mandated tests on Monday morning. Not in New York, they got rid of them for the rest of the year, but theoretically, here we go. So the pilot's unconscious mind just might weigh in on the decision. These are some important reasons to be back. So now the pilot estimates that the likelihood of actually encountering the condition is improbable, but stays with the severity of the consequences of the severe turbulence is critical. So the risk, therefore, falls into the green or the medium risk area. Now, it's much easier to make the decision to begin the flight. The un unconscious mind uh, maybe just lured our pilot into the trap of making a bad decision. Now, we also have the I'm safe checklist. It's a well-known tool for analytical decision making. It asks us to self-evaluate for illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and emotion. Sometimes that E is shown to represent eating, but in any case, we're self-evaluating. And when we self-evaluate, external factors can sneak in. Similarly, we've all seen the PAVE checklist. The P represents the pilot, and that would refer us to the I'm safe checklist. Next, we evaluate the aircraft, the environment, and any external pressures. This, at least, asks us to look for those external pressures, but we can't avoid looking for them through the filter of our unconscious mind, which includes all of our cognitive biases. So here's the real problem with using these tools. They all rely on subjective decisions, and our unconscious mind can have a real field day with subjective decisions. We would prefer to use tools that require us to make objective decisions. The Flight Risk Assessment Tool, or the FRAT, along with the Personal Minimums Checklist, both require us to make objective decisions. These are valuable tools. The FRAT, why do we use it in business aviation? But both the FRAT and the Personal Minimums Checklist must be developed well before the flight and customized to you personally. Probably no two people will have the exact same one. We, of course, do not have time to go into more detail today on how to do that. Uh, there's much more information available online, including some templates. And shortly, I will, when we finish the presentation, I will show you a link where I put some of that information online. You can download it easily or uh, take courses, whatever. So how can we position ourselves to make better analytical decisions? First, we should become as knowledgeable as possible about weather, aircraft performance, the airplane or airplanes we fly, our avionics, and everything else that pertains to flying. That, of course, though, is a journey without end. We should read articles, take courses, watch videos, and participate in any owner's organizations for the type of airplanes we fly. And next, we should move decisions from the subjective to the objective to the extent that we can do that. Okay. So after analytical decision-making, we have rapid decision-making. Let's take a deeper look at rapid decision-making. The key word is rapid or rapidly. This defines a situation in which a decision is needed in seconds or in, at most, a very few minutes. Again, we have some tools to help us with our rapid decision-making, but again, uh, we might find some flaws. 
One tool is the decide model. The first item, detect, recognizes that something is amiss. Maybe the oil temperature is higher than normal. Then we estimate whether we need to address the issue. This is one place in which we need to be aware of the influence of our unconscious mind. Our cognitive biases can work to make us believe that, oh, it'll be okay, it's just a temporary anomaly and no action is required. And then we choose a desirable outcome. Again, our cognitive biases can lead us down the path that the desirable outcome is to continue on and complete the flight. That's always the most desirable outcome, but it might not be the best choice. Of course, the desirable, desirable outcome uh, should always be to avoid the accident. So then we're instructed to identify actions which could successfully control the change. Maybe we can reduce power or if we're in a climb. Maybe we can lower the nose a bit and increase airspeed. If we have cowl flaps, maybe we can open them if they are not already open. We can check oil pressure to see if it's low, which might indicate low oil quantity. Then we do the necessary action to adapt to the change. And then finally, we evaluate the effect of the action, and we just repeat the process if necessary. Another tool is the OODA loop. It instructs us to observe the problem, orient ourselves to the problem, decide what to do about the problem, and then act to solve the problem. Being a loop, we begin again by observing the effect of our action, again orienting ourselves to the revised situation, and so on. But the first three steps are, again, vulnerable to our cognitive biases and external factors, so caution is advised uh, when we use those as well. And we have the 3P model. You've all seen this. This one tells us to perceive the problem, process the problem, and perform the corrective action. I think that's what we do intuitively, and this doesn't provide much guidance as to how we should accomplish that. And we must recognize that our perception of the problem, as well as our choice of a process, are both very much vulnerable to our cognitive biases and the influence of external factors. Uh, though possibly flawed because of our humanness, these tools do have value in that they establish a method for decision making. Nothing can completely insulate us from the influence of our unconscious mind, but recognizing the potential negative effects can sometimes help us to make better decisions, and that's really, as humans, all we can hope for. Now, we can improve our rapid decision-making by building our experience backgrounds and increasing our aeronautical knowledge. Increasing our knowledge and understanding of whether our airplane systems, our electronic systems, can provide a solid basis for making better decisions. If you don't already have one, I recommend developing an abnormal procedures checklist. This can provide valuable guidance for situations that are not emergencies, at least not yet, but might require attention. This is also a means to help move decisions from the subjective to the objective. And make sure you have a good emergency procedures checklist readily available. Frequently review the procedures for the various emergencies. You might want to augment the checklist provided by the manufacturer. If there are memory items, make sure you keep them fresh in your mind. Uh, when we finish the presentation, I'm going to show you how to get a reference page for this webinar, and that page has several useful links, and one of them is to a free online course that walks you through the development or enhancement of your own uh, checklist, including the uh, abnormal procedures checklist. Okay, so how can we position ourselves to make better rapid decisions? Again, increasing our knowledge and experience uh, base is very important. Next, we should move decisions from the subjective to the objective to the extent possible and have and be familiar with abnormal and emergency procedures checklists. And then, and then, we move into urgent decision making. This is when an immediate course of action is required. Examples might be flames suddenly appearing from within the engine compartment or losing power immediately after takeoff. We have a very few seconds in which to make the correct decision. Uh, Dr. Gary Klein from Harvard has done a great, great work in the area of decision making. And he shows us a model in which we are presented with a situation and we ask the question, is it familiar? In other words, have we been trained for this in some way, or do we have some previous experience with it? 
If the answer is yes, then we proceed with a model that he shows similar to uh, what we've already seen in other formats. But if we're not familiar with the situation, we resort to what he calls optimized decision making. Much of his research was done with firefighters who are sometimes faced with making a life or death decision with only seconds to respond. Uh, for our purposes, we will use the terms optimized decision making and urgent decision making interchangeably. Okay, so if we say optimized decision making, same as urgent decision making and vice versa. Uh, we look only at the first part of Dr. Klein's model here, uh, where he deals with his optimized decision making. Uh, we have a situation which is not familiar to us, so we resort to optimized or urgent decision making. This approach is one that gets the job done as quickly as possible. Rather than deliberate over multiple options, a person with the necessary experience can immediately come up with a suitable course of action. It is, quite literally, the first thing that comes to mind. Then the person only need evaluate the course of action with a simple question. Will it work? But, very important, this method, method only works when the person has the necessary experience. Note that we say necessary experience. A thicker logbook does not guarantee the right kind of experience. So how can we develop that necessary experience? Well, a PCATD can be an extremely valuable aid in building an experience background. It's most effective when used as a group activity with lots of discussion with, of course, proper social distancing. But you might check, and uh, well, some of you may already have one of these at home, you might check to see if your local FBO or flying club uh, has one. Uh, they're not super expensive, but they're not real cheap. So a lot of organizations that would have one are very happy to rent it out for a very reasonable hourly rate. And you can get with an instructor and get in it. And most of them, you can actually log the time if you do that. But you don't have to be with an instructor. Any ex other experienced pilot, you sit there and you work out problems and you experiment and you really can't get hurt unless, you know, you fall off your chair or something in it. So uh, you can try things and see what works and see what doesn't work. And, and you may not even realize it when you're doing this, but you're building your experience background. Um, yeah, these don't really help you with stick and rudder skills, but they sure help us with procedures and with decision making. I'm a, I'm a big fan, if you didn't guess that already. Uh, prior to the pandemic, I used to promote an airport social gathering with time set aside for safety discussions. Uh, now, maybe we should think about a virtual gathering. But in any case, we can learn from the experiences, both positive and negative, of other pilots. We don't need to have all those adventures ourselves. We, we can learn from people who do it. And, you know, the aviation publications have stories. And uh, um, that that's one of the reasons in my presentations, I don't have any tonight, but uh, I usually go through accident discussions and show you what happened and uh, how the pilot may have not done so good or maybe could have done better or or in some cases um, did what was needed and kind of saved the day kind of thing but um, just explore and learn how to learn how to do these these things yourself okay we must frequently remind ourselves of what we have learned um, we used to joke about armchair flying but actually I think it's pretty valuable sit in a comfortable chair and kind of close your eyes and uh, just think about some of the adventures you've had, some of the things that you've learned, go over them in your mind. Our, our brains put things away, you know, farther and farther away if we don't use them. And every time we bring something up to the front of the mind and think about it, um, it's there for a little while longer and we might be, uh, might be calling upon it. Uh, doing simple things, like reminding ourselves of the criteria for a stabilized approach and the go-around procedure for the airplane we're flying prior to each approach refresh our memory, promote more effective, optimized decision-making uh, should the time um, arise for that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I told you that uh, we would look at some, um, at a page for some links. So before I forget to tell you, I just want to do that. Uh, if you want some helpful references on this webinar, go to the website vectorsforsafety.com. It's shown up at the top of the screen there, vectorsforsafety.com. And then um, what I've circled on here, there are uh, drop-down menus and go to the uh, download, download slash links page. And on that, this is only a part of the page there, um, you'll find things for the flight risk assessment tool, 
personal minimums checklist, the uh, free checklist course. Um, actually, at the moment, I just created that today, and I already don't remember everything I had on it. But anyway, it's it's worth um, it's worth checking out, I believe. All right, before we move into Lane, let's uh, see if we have any discussion. Lane, are you on to look at some questions? If we have any, I'm here. Um, at the moment, I'm not seeing any questions. Oh, okay. But thank you for putting on a great webinar from my uh, time. Okay. All right. Well, um, well, good. I guess if there's no no questions, that either means uh, everybody fell asleep or it was clear <laughs> to understand. <I'm> not, <laughs> we'll, we'll go with the it was clear to understand option. How's that? That, that sound good? I like that one. All right. All right. Let's move on. Um, now, for our featured guest, uh, Lane is going to take the left seat here for a little bit, and he's going to tell us about his engine failure adventure, and you can still enter questions. You know, somebody uh, somebody said, go ahead, I'm awake. Good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for saving the day here. Uh, Lane is going to take the left seat, and he's going to tell us about his engine failure adventure, and I will say adventure because, uh, spoiler alert, it ended well. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, just to put this in perspective before Lane starts, um, Lane flies out of the Salinas, California airport, and this is the Google Earth view uh, of that airport. It's a towered airport, uh, fairly long runways, uh, you know, reasonable amount of traffic. And here's zoomed out quite a bit on the Google Earth view. I'm just going to change to my spotlight here. And this is Lane's practice area right in here. There's some flat fields there, which would be suitable for emergency landing site. And... Um, he also uses those straight lines as references uh, when flying his aerobatic routines, and uh, he monitors the tower and um, uh, NorCal approach and, and makes sure there's no other airplanes there, and when he hears somebody approaching, he stops his routine and goes upright and looks around and does all that kind of stuff, which reminds me, if you didn't already register, we have a very good webinar coming up, and it's all brand new material on the 16th, I believe, on called... Um, Avoiding mid-air collisions, and um, I, I, I actually finished that presentation this morning, so it's, it's ready to go. So we'll, uh, sign up for that if you haven't already. All right, um, let me back up here. And Lane, go ahead. Uh, the, the, you have the controls. Oh, that's a scary thought. Gene, thank you. <laughs> so um, this event happened back in uh, 2017. It was in May. Uh, it was on a Friday, as a matter of fact. I am a member of the International Aerobatic Club, and I compete um, as an amateur competitor, um, mostly in California. We do have um, actual international teams. Uh, there are world competitions, as well as almost every state has got several chapters. So. Excuse anyway, me a second, Wayne. Wayne, why don't you uh, turn your webcam on so we can see you since there aren't too many uh, slides related to this here, and then we'll uh, uh, see your smiling right. face. There you go. Gotcha. Thank you. So um, I uh, was an intermediate pilot at this time, and I was getting ready to move up to advanced. And uh, so on this particular day, I was going to go out to my practice area and uh, fly through the advanced uh, power knowns. And so my routine was to go through the sequence, whichever one it was. I was practicing a couple of times, and then if there was issues that I had anywhere, I would work on those individually, but I would start out just flying the sequence cold as if I was at a contest. <clears throat> so I did my pre-flight that day. My plane holds uh, 10 quarts of oil, and uh, but curiously, if I actually filled it with 10 quarts of oil, I would come home with nine no matter what. If I fill it, if I go out and fly at nine, I would come home with nine. So it just, it, it liked to have nine quarts. That's what I ran it on. On this particular day, I was a half quart low. I was a little bit lazy. I didn't feel like meeting out a half a quart of oil. So I just threw in a whole quart knowing that I was going to probably blow out that extra half and no big deal. Uh, I went out to my practice area and that is about uh, 10 miles away from the airport. And, um, the first time through the sequence, uh, doing the advanced unknown that year, um, I, I rolled upright, and I noticed that my uh, number two engine, I have a, a G4, an Insight G4 engine monitor that tracks all my cylinders, cylinder head temperature, and what have you, had gone into yellow. It had gotten up to 413 degrees, and that engine uh, was a modified. It came out of a twin and was modified to do aerobatics, uh, to be inverted. 
So that was not abnormal. And as soon as I throttled back, it dropped back into the green, so all was well. The second time through the sequence, it stayed in the green most of the way. Normally, I wouldn't be paying attention to that all that much. I'm more concerned with the sequence and what figure is coming next. But because it had gone yellow, I was kind of checking in on it. Um, I finished my sequence the second time, rolled upright, because that particular sequence ended inverted. And happily, um, my sequences generally have me flying towards the airport when I'm done. And so um, uh, as I rolled upright, I noticed I had smoke coming up between my legs. So my first thought was, oh, crap, I'm on fire, and um, I'm going to have to bail out. So I'm now looking immediately for some place to point the planes so I don't throw a flaming meteor in somebody's uh, farmhouse. Um, I quickly noticed that it didn't smell like electrical smoke. There was no flames. It didn't smell like a fire. It smelled like oil. And um, my plane is designed to throw the excess oil that comes out of the slobber pot into the exhaust. So I will lay a smoke trail, much like a smoke system, on occasion. And so for an instant, I thought, oh, I've just flown through my own smoke trail, no big deal, except that, of course, it was ongoing. And so that became apparent that, no, we have a, an actual problem here. And I checked my oil pressure, and I was down to 40 pounds, which was about 20 lower than it should be. So at that point, I'm still real close to 10 miles away from the airport, but I know, since I know I'm not on fire, um, and I also note that I'm too low to comfortably bail out, I call the airport and say, um, I have smoke in the cockpit, I'm going to try to make it back. And so I, at that point, maintained altitude and uh, maintained uh, heading towards the airport and just kind of kept my eyes open for a place in case I had to uh, put it down, do an off-field landing. That was the, the next issue that I was hoping to avoid. Um, airport asked me for how much fuel I had on board, and they offered me uh, runway 26. They came back later and offered 3-1, which is more of a straight-in approach, and because of crosswinds and the possibility of doing a dead stick landing, I decided to decline that, and I stayed with 2-6. I did not declare a mayday. Um, they did ask if I wanted assistance, and that seemed like a good idea, so I said yes, and so they rolled the fire trucks. Um, the engine ran, amazingly enough, fine, all the way till I once I was sure I had the runway made, then I throttled back. The minute I changed my power settings, that thing just turned into a rock crusher. Um, and so uh, with a lot of shaking, it, we came down. It was probably one of the better landings I've ever done, notably. And uh, 100 feet after I touched down, it quit. That was it. Pop just went, and we were done. So at that point, I just let the plane roll and coasted towards the side. Um, my plane's got a 21-foot wingspan. It's a 150-foot wide runway, and in my mind, somehow that made me less of an obstacle, <laughs> despite the fact that I had just closed the uh, runway. And and that was that. We pushed it back to the uh, the hangar, and we drained out 20 ounces of oil. So true or not, in my mind, that extra half a quart I put in is what got me home. That's my story. <laughs> wow, very good. Um, that's amazing. I, I have never had an engine failure. I uh, Once I shut one down on a multi-engine airplane and continued to fly, but that doesn't count. <laughs> I had low oil pressure and high oil temperature and decided that uh, we, we'd save that engine to fly another day and shut it down and continued. But beyond that, I never, uh, never had anything like that. So um, we commend you for keeping your cool on that. Uh, I worked up some uh, decision points here. Uh, Lane had written his event out and sent it to me prior. And what I'd like to do here is just kind of go through these decision points and uh, relate them back to what we did. So, um, Lane, during your, during your pre-flight inspection, I call it an event. You noticed you were a half quart low, a half quart lower than what, so that must have been at what, eight and a half quarts, because probably no yes. like nine, right? Okay, eight and a half quarts. Uh, so you made a decision, you had a decision, an analytical decision, I think, uh, should I add oil? Or should I not? And he decided, yeah, add oil. And then you decided to add the 
the full court instead of the half court. I think that was another analytical decision, right? Yes, it was, you know, probably based more on laziness than anything else, but yes. But, but whatever works. And um, if you recall, Wayne said that, that he thinks that extra half court is what, what got him back to the airport, that he probably wouldn't have gotten back had he not had that extra half court in there. So those were analytical decisions. Um, you know, you, there's no fault with any of them. They they worked, and the one that worked out the best uh, probably, I mean, you just didn't have, we make these decisions on the information we have, and you didn't have the information that you were going to need that extra half court to go back, so you kind of lucked out on that one. All right, now, um, during your, your first aerobatic routine, I think, this was event, the second event, um, your, one of the cylinder, number two cylinder temperature rose into the yellow. Um, yeah. So then I think that would be a rapid decision, would it not? Uh, is this significant or is it not, right? And you decided that it was not, I'm guessing because you'd seen that kind of thing happen before when flying routines. Um, that and the fact that the minute I throttled back, it dropped into the green. Had it stayed in the yellow, I would have, discontinued uh, my aerobatic flying and aimed for home. Okay, yeah, so so that was a rapid decision. You had um, not a lot of time to make the decision, but you made the decision and that worked out good. And then the next event that I have down here that I made out of this was um, you had smoke visible. So yeah. uh, then there's a decision. Am I on fire or am I not on fire? And I think we would consider that to be an urgent decision, right? <laughs> It certainly seemed urgent at the time, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wayne, uh, this, this is what I have called a, 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 a pass moment, P-A-S-S, -S, pants okay. almost seriously soiled. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, seriously. So, so uh, then, then the result of, we had the decision to make a mind fire or not, but you had an awareness and that's what all our decisions are based on, really, is what awareness do we have at the time of the various components to our, our situation. And the awareness that the smoke smelled like oil. So probably it was oil burning and not something else, like electronics burning or anything else, right? Okay. Right. So, and, so that, and eliminating fire was uh, a big piece of the puzzle because that uh, cloth-covered plane. So fire... Right. If there's if there's fire, it's get out, get out, right, all right, okay, and then uh, that brings us to the next decision, bail out or not. Now I think this one was not an urgent decision. This was a rapid decision, right? Because you had a little bit of time, you know, not not ten minutes, but you had a little bit of time to figure that out, and you had an awareness that you were already headed toward the airport and an awareness that you were reasonably close to the airport, not within gliding distance, but reasonably close, and you had an awareness that there was no fire, and you mentioned um, in your note to me that uh, you were below bailout altitude at that point. Right. Yes, so, the minimum minimum bailout uh, on my chute that says 2,000 feet, and I was just at 2,000 feet, and so effectively, I mean, in order to bail out, you're going to have to, you know, discard the canopy, unbuckle. Right. Meantime, you're not flying the plane, you're not going to maintain altitude. So, so that's that's really significant. So let, let's talk about that for just for just a little bit. Um, you had that awareness you were below bailout altitude. Now, one of the things that we stressed was you have to have, uh, you know, the the background and the knowledge. Uh, to make these rapid and urgent decisions. And the more you know, the more likely you are to make the right decision. That was right there in your brain, um, bail at altitude. So that was something that you knew, wait a minute, this could be a real problem, where potentially if somebody hadn't done their homework on that, they hadn't thought about that, that, oh, the regs say I've got to wear this parachute, but I'm never going to bail out, that's not an issue. But then all of a sudden if they if they saw that smoke, assumed they were on fire, got low, and then bailed out, that could have been a real nasty situation for somebody. So so here we are where where the knowledge, uh, the experience, uh, guided you to make the right decision at that point. Would you agree with that? 
Yeah, to, to be clear though, just one thing to throw in there, had I been on fire, I would have bailed out. Right, right. Regardless, at that point. Regardless, you know, right. Yeah. But, yeah. but once that was eliminated, then at that point, that in combination with the altitude, right. now I'm going to try to get the plane, if, if it quits, I'm going to try to put it on the ground and, and just climb out. Right. So, so actually that, that am I on fire now, going back to that, that, that definitely was an urgent decision and you had to rely on, um, you know, what works? Will this work? <laughs> and then, well, this work was, yeah, I'm going to stay in this airplane and that turned out to be the right uh, choice. The, the research uh, that Dr. Klein did on this is, is just absolutely fascinating stuff. If anybody's really interested in more on that, I have another free course online. You can get to it from the Vectors website um, that's called Urgent Decision Making. It's a whole, like an hour course on that. And it, it walks through how Dr. Klein did the research working with a group of firefighters. And uh, I won't tell the whole story, but uh, a, a fire lieutenant, it was in this burning building and, and uh, something didn't seem right to him. And he said, all right, get out, everybody out. And he took his whole crew out, and seconds after they got out, the floor collapsed. Uh, right. They thought that they thought the kitchen was on fire, but it wasn't. The, the, the cellar was on fire, and the flames were coming up through the kitchen, so the floor was weakened. And he started telling people that he had ESP, and that was why he got out. <laughs> and they went, well, wait a minute. <laughs> so Dr. Klein interviewed him, and I think he used hypnosis and everything, and it, and it turned out that, all these different things he knew about fire that he'd gained from experience over the years and how fire acted, how it felt, uh, where the heat was coming from, all those kinds of things went into that decision. And he didn't even really make a conscious decision. He just said, get out. And they did. And it saved everybody's life. So, yes. And, and on that note, in a similar way, um, uh, the decision to bail out, um, I was happily told by the person who taught me to do aerobatics, is made before you get in the plane. You have to know, you know, okay, why yep. why you're going to get out, and and so, you know, before you even take off, you're going, okay, these are the reasons why I would bail out, and and that way, it's not a decision you are going to have time to make in the, right. in the moment. You got to yeah. Kind of time. Good point. That's one of the advantages also, though, of having, you know, I, I wish all pilots could have the benefit of the full motion simulators and the, the kind of tra uh, training that you get in the airline or in um, in business aviation going through that. There's so many scenarios that that are like that, that you work through and you do them and you do them and you do them, and you just know what you're going to do if these sorts of things happen, and we just don't have the benefit of that in, in general aviation. But anyway, we keep talking about these things, and maybe someday... Uh, Maybe, maybe maybe it helps a little bit. All right, so um, so now you're gonna you're gonna stick with the airplane, um, and your next decision is you're going to return to the airport, and that was a rapid decision. Um, yeah. You you could have decided to shut everything down and land in a field right there, but why if the airport's in in range, right? So that was a rapid decision. You said, okay, we're going to go back, and then you had another decision. Should I change altitude or not? Uh, you had mentioned in the, the note that you sent me that um, as you analyzed this afterward, you thought, well, gee, maybe I should have climbed, which would have given me more glide. But, of course, then the time you lose in the climb and, and all those kinds of things. But, again, we I called this a rapid decision in here because you did have a little bit of time to sort it out. But, really, all your experience is racing through your head and guiding your decision in there that, that wait a minute, <laughs> Let's keep. Let's just keep going to the airport. And also, your decision not to change. Yeah, talk talk to me about your decision not to change power settings because you said that once you did, the engine quit. And I've heard. I'm no expert in engines. Uh, my son is, and he's doing a webinar coming up. He's doing a couple of them late in the month on on engines. And you could ask him this. I have to ask him this. But I have heard many times that if you've got a rough running engine. Um, don't change power settings because it, it, that, that's maybe going to make it do something nasty. Or I did that a number of times, and uh, and you did that. Did you did you make a conscious decision not to change power settings, or you were just like? No, I think it was really more intuitive. It was kind of along the lines of um, it's it's working. Don't change it. Just don't, okay. Yeah. No. Don't argue with. 
if it ain't broke or ain't broke too bad, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I thought about throttling back at one point because uh, I'm watching my oil pressure drained. I think in the last two minutes of flight, uh, I was showing zero oil pressure at that point. Mm. And speaking yeah. of which, well, you can throw those other slides up. I see a couple of questions the guys want to know. So what, what happened? Why did you lose oil? Now, the slides that you're going to see that Gene's going to throw up there, are the way it looked after we got it back in the yeah, head. We got we got uh, some pictures of broken broken engines here. Let's let's finish this this uh, this going down through these decisions. Yeah. Then we'll go to all that. Um, uh, it was mostly just you know, it's it's running. Don't don't change. Just kind of leave things alone. Um, okay. So so you had an awareness that engine failure was imminent. I mean it was. Very little question with zero oil pressure and it's not running that, 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 that this is not going to keep going forever here. Yeah. So uh, you had a rapid, you, made, you had to make a rapid decision and you said that you scanned the area for suitable airport landing sites and you continued to do that all the way in. So that was a, uh, that was a correct decision. And that's, that's kind of where I think we're, that we have that ingrained in us. I hope we all do anyway. But then you had a decision what to communicate to the tower. And you did not declare a mayday. You just told them matter of factly that you had a problem. That was a rapid decision. Um, do you want to talk about that at all? Why well, not Why not yeah, a May Day? That's it. I, I cannot, uh, today, I cannot tell you exactly why I did not declare May Day other than, I mean, it, I, it wasn't a question of being concerned about paperwork. I just somehow, I, I think I was more focused on just, keeping everything going, flying the plane. Um, but notably, they said, do you want assistance? And I said, yes. I thought that was probably a yeah. good idea. So they did roll trucks. If going, Looking back at that, would I, if I was going to do it differently, would I declare a May Day today, given the exact same situation? I think yes. I think I would, A, I, I would probably declare a May Day. And one thing that I didn't even th think to do that I would absolutely do today is I would have uh, squawked 7,700. Okay, well, well, two things on that. One, uh, I think everybody can learn the lesson from this that you don't have to declare a mayday. You tell ATC you got a problem, and you got their attention, and they yeah. and they take and they take care of you. You know, the the verbiage is it's you know it's there. The people that get in trouble are the ones that don't. They're, they're not forthright about something. Well, could I have a short approach to this right yeah, when the engine's <laughs> coming apart? You know, uh, really, I've got I've got cases where people never said that they had an engine that was in imminent failure, and they requested a short approach, or requested priority handling, or something. But they never said I got a problem with this engine, um, and it and it didn't and it didn't end well. So as long as we communicate with them, and in terms of the seventy seven hundred. Um, you may have done the right thing by staying on the code. They were were you squawking twelve hundred or an assigned code? I was squawking. Actually, I was squawking twelve hundred at that time. Okay, okay. So twelve hundred, yeah, seventy seven hundred would have got their attention. If you're on an assigned code, it's usually better to stay on that assigned code and yeah. don't go to seventy seven hundred unless they tell you to, because then they because now they they know who you are and all that stuff. So anyway, okay. And then they offered you um, runway three one, and you decided. Uh, there was uh, too much of a crosswind on that runway, so that was a rapid decision, and you right. got uh, two six assigned. So uh, that was also a rapid decision. Those were rapid decisions that you were making as you were as you were continuing to fly the well, airplane. You know, so it, uh, at that time, two six was the runway that was uh, in use, and uh, so when they initially came back to me, they gave me a number one for two six. And then as, you know, because we're, they're asking me how much fuel do you have on board, and I'm telling that, and I'm also hoping they're not going to tell me to try and, you know, drain off fuel, because that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> Dump fuel, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and I was keeping them apprised of my oil pressure and what was going on. So, um, but because 2.6 was, I mean, when I'm out practicing, I always monitor, I listen to ATIS, so I know roughly what I'm getting into when I'm coming back in. And there was, um, the winds were favoring 2.6, they were not favoring 3.1. The advantage to 3.1 would have only been that it was kind of lined up with where I was coming from, so it would have been a more straight-in approach. Um, but because of the fact that I knew there were crosswinds, that the wind was favoring 2.6, and I was considering that I, I might be very likely doing a dead stick landing by the time I got there, um, I 
I opted to stay with 2.6. Okay, excellent. Okay. Um, all right, super. Um, so let's let's look at these pictures, and then we can. I, I'll go through the questions. Uh, we'll switch roles. Lane usually asks the answers, reads the questions for me, and we go from there. Um, this again was uh, the airport, and um, my pointer up here again, and just just for review, this was the area in which this first began, so Lane's going to fly up the valley here, heading out in, in there. Um, here's um, here's one one picture, and when you're <laughs> when your angel looks like that, you're not having a good day. Not a good um, day. Now, notably, so this, the piston was not hanging out like that when I landed, but you can see if you look at the top of that, that's where it cracked all the way around number one cylinder. Mm. Uh, and so that was where it was hemorrhaging all the oil out. And then once we got it back in the hangar, we lifted that piece off. And you could see, I mean, it was, uh, I'm not really sure what was holding it on. It had sheared off one long bolt and two short bolts down where the barrel attaches. Um, the, uh, it was. Yeah, it right was, here, yeah, the, the sheared mouth. off bolt. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, <clears throat> and then uh, what are we looking at here? Well, so you can see on that left picture there, that's where everything is still kind of in place. You can see the crack uh, where before yeah. we lift that piece off. Yep. Yeah. Um, so that was where that whole case let go. And, and it's hard to say, you know, did uh, hard to say why it why it failed. I don't think anyone has ever come up with an exact a reason. This is the and the right picture is the piece that uh, we lifted out. Um, the engine had, um, I forget, I think it had 700 hours on it, uh, since its last, uh, overhaul. And I could account for probably 500 of those. Um, it had never given any signs of, of imminent failure before. So I really don't know why. I don't know what happened. I don't know if it... If uh, something sheared and it ran rough and that cracked the case, or if the case cracked and then ran rough, it's right. <clears throat> and no one has ever told me that when I, because of that whole incident, and I was a little unsure of how well I handled it, I did file a NASA report, and so they asked me, "Are you going to repair the engine?" And I said, "No." <laughs> <laughs> That'd be quite well, a repair. <laughs> so That'd be quite a repair there, and yeah, yeah. get the super glue out. Or the yeah. duct tape or something, yeah. Maybe and uh, what, what do we have here? And this is just showing the, the scoring on the cylinder, which wasn't bad. And when you previously, the other one you can see on the top, there wasn't a lot of detonation going on. Um, it it's just kind of goes to there, there wasn't the kind of where you would anticipate um, with that kind of an event. So... Uh, it's really still kind of a mystery to me as to what what went south, but it sure it went there fast. <laughs> wow! Yeah. All right, we got. Um, let's let's back up. Maybe. Mm -hmm. oh, there. All right. Let's look at some of the some of the, the questions here. This isn't a question; it's a it's a comment, and I think it's a good one. Uh, good for you for knowing the temps and pressures, uh, what they are normally. I wonder if. If many pilots know uh, that for their for their airplanes, uh, that that's a good point. You should know what's normal for that engine and for that airplane, and uh, go from there. So somebody's giving you kudos for that, and I will too. Um, next question is what caused the oil leak? I think you've addressed that that you did not know. Yeah, you don't know. Yeah, okay. Um, what was wrong? Where did the oil go? Well, yeah. So big crack and the oil left and that was so the smoke that i was getting between my legs was actually the smoke exiting the case hitting that hot engine and and you know the oil rather uh, hitting the engine and being burned into oil smoke and then it was just getting sucked in through the uh, the vents and coming mm -hmm. in through the into the cockpit so right. the eagle on the you know, it doesn't show real well in that picture in flight, but there's two little scoops uh, towards the front that help air come into the cockpit, and I'll then there's here, right? two little vents. Um, actually, they're on the in the in-flight picture. 
kind of like right by the wires. Yeah, so if you come right underneath my head almost. Oh, yeah, here. right there, there's a little oh. vent. Oh, okay, that, yeah. yeah. Soft okay. vent, and there's a, a small intake vent on the other side. That one on my side is gone because I had controls when I converted this to a, a single-place plane. Um, and that's something else I should say. So this plane started out life as a, a two-seat Eagle. It was an Eagle II. And uh, the guy I bought it from had put a big six-cylinder engine in it. And that was great. He was kind of a Tim the Tool Man, you know, so it, it <laughs> more power. Um, but it really messed with the CG. And I left that alone uh, until my wife finally decided she didn't want to get in anymore. And <laughs> so... Um, and, and that was uh, that our second date was in that plane. <laughs> so, <laughs> and she married you anyway. Wow. <laughs> so, so, but once she didn't want to get in, then what I did to fix the CG problem was I took the front seat out and we built a whole new main tank and a header tank that all went in where the front seat used to be. And that shifted the CG aft to where it wanted to be for that engine. Cause otherwise the plane was very nose heavy. And in doing that on the, left side there, the port side, that intake vent went away. On the other side that you can't see, there's actually a scoop that helps air come in and it cools off that cockpit. Because that plane, on a warm day, if that cockpit will easily do 105, 110 degrees. If you're 95 to 100 degrees on the tarmac, you're smoking in there. And you can't open the, the canopy. Once the engine starts, that canopy is closed and locked. Uh, and it doesn't come open until you're getting out. Oh, okay. All right. Interesting. Next question was, what caused the loss of oil? We've addressed that. We don't know. Uh, next one, why did the engine failure happen? An oil line failure of some sort, oil cap come loose? No. Um, we, don't, we don't know that, right? <laughs> I'm going to say my my best guess, and, and I am not a mechanic. You know, everything I know about airplane engines, I learned on this plane. And you could write that on the head of a nail. I have a, a very good friend who is an AI and is my personal mechanic, except that, he, I mean, he doesn't work for me just personally. But anything that gets done on that plane, including work that I'm doing, he's looking over my shoulder and watching. Um, just I'm thinking just fatigue. I think the case just failed. I don't know how, you know, I think it, whether it was overheating maybe, over successive flights because when you're doing aerobatics the engines do get hot um, I did not have uh, a you know six cylinder monitoring when I first bought the plane it just came with the uh, you know your basic EGT and that was it uh, it was when I converted the plane to a single seat that I added the insight G4 because I was able to then change the entire uh, instrument panel and, and set things up so then I was able to actually see what each cylinder was doing all the time. Uh, so it could be that in the early years that I was flying it, the engine was getting overheated, who knew? You, you wouldn't think that number one would be a problem because that's right up there at the front where it's getting the most air, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, of course, number one gets the most air, but it also, that's, I suppose that's not always the greatest thing. If the engine's hot, there's, you're more likely to get shot cooling on number one than you are farther back, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll never we'll never know the answer to that. Uh comment that you can't get in trouble calling an emergency. Yep, that is uh, that is true, but it's important to know that let the ATC folks know and they'll work it out. Actually ATC can declare an emergency for you if they yes. if they so deem. Um uh what type and size of engine? Was it Lycoming? What was it? Uh it was, uh it's a it came out of a twin. It was originally an IO five forty and uh the fellow that I bought it from Actually, he took it to a guy in Farmersville, Ohio, that converted it to a, an aerobatic engine. Uh, but it was an IO 540 with 10 to 1 pistons in. Ah, okay. Yeah, that was. Uh, I've got I a lot of time behind those IO 540s and twins, the, the the standard ones, you know, not the not the converter ones. Um, pretty reliable engine. Things happen. Um, I I had a friend. He's passed away now. He was a metallurgist and uh, also a pilot. And he said that. You know, castings, that's what those cases are. They're castings. And uh, that um, one little air bubble in a casting, and, and it, it 
it can go a very long time and then all of a sudden it fails there's absolutely no way to know it it's there yeah. so who knows we don't know um, but the lesson is that we need to be prepared for these things you know and you were the the, the, the people that fly that oh that won't happen to me well maybe it won't we hope it won't but maybe it will what were you saying yeah the thing i was gonna say that uh, the things my routine for flying was uh, because one of the things I had said in the note to you was that um, should I have been reviewing my bailout procedures as I was flying back to the airport? And it probably might not have been a bad idea, but I think it was better to just keep flying the plane. And and that was the, the one thing that I remember uh, hearing from uh, Wayne Handley was, you know, never stop flying the plane until you get out of it. Yeah, you know, that's right. Fly it, fly it right down to the end. Even if it's a crash, you fly it as far into the crash as you can. That's uh, right. Absolutely. No because you, you still have the possibility of steering around the big stuff when you get on the ground, too. Yeah, that is absolutely true. So, so there was that thought. There was, you know, I, I review why I would get out of the plane. I do a bailout procedure. I review the bailout procedure getting in, and every time I climb out, I actually do a mock bailout, even though I'm being a lot more careful as I'm getting out, but I, mm -hmm. I go through it so that it's a matter of rote because it's not something I want to have to think about. Right. The uh, the next question uh, says, Mayday, 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 uh, making the radio call, Mayday, 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 and what is the expected uh, response? I can take take that one. The um, it's better to say if you are going to call Mayday, 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 and state the nature of your emergency, because otherwise the expected response from ATC is state the nature of your emergency, which takes more time, and then you have to go. So just uh, do it and say it, and then uh, you know, and clear clearly as you can, and don't worry about the right phraseology because uh, it's there. Uh, I know somebody would ask this one, um, uh, Elaine. What is the diamond-shaped wires on the rudder? I don't think they're on the rudder. I think they're between the wings, right? Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's actually a sighting device that is attached to the uh, left eye strut. Um, and so that that is something I use in aerobatics. It gives me my horizontal vertical lines and 45 lines. And there's also, what you can't see in that picture, is there's a, a little string that is tied to the end of it that strings out. And that's so I can tell, I know this is going to sound stupid, but it's so I can tell if I'm flying forward or backwards. <laughs> when you're at the when you're at the top of the line, um, uh, you actually when the plane starts to slip back on its tail, you don't actually feel it until the controls start to come alive again because you have no air movement over everything is just spongy soft. But if you're looking out, you'll see that string will suddenly flip backwards, and the minute it does that, you are no longer flying forwards. Uh -huh. Now, if, um, if you're doing a tail slide you need to make sure that you slide at least uh, uh, half the, the length of the fuselage before you flop. If you're trying to do like a hammerhead, you need to kick before that happens because you lose points if you're sliding backwards. You need to hit right at the apex of the line. Mm -hmm. So that that's what that is. It's a sighting device that's uh, just to help me orient to kind of what's up and what's down. Next question is, uh, in hindsight, what would you have done different? Well, I think, you know, A, never argue with success. I I think, um, you know, altitude is your friend. By the same token, the fact that I the engine quit 100 feet after I touched down, I don't know that trading distance for altitude would have been a, a good decision. So about the only thing that I might, that I would seriously consider doing differently would be maybe being straight out and declaring a mayday rather than just talking to the tower and tell I think saying smoke in the cockpit is a pretty good indication that you have an issue but there's nothing wrong in my mind with saying mayday I mean it that was definitely uh, I was pretty sure I was going to park that in somebody's field on the way back I right. never had any expectation of of getting all the way back until I was within a half a mile and then I knew that I had the run. Once I knew I had the runway made, then I started making changes and, and descending and pulling back on, on power. The 7700, only, the only thing that occurs to me is you don't know how long you're going to have communication. So anything that I could have done to have helped someone on the ground know where the hell I was if everything went completely sideways would have been to my advantage. 
Um, right, right. But but otherwise, I, you know, I, I didn't panic. I continued to fly the plane. I maintained altitude. I kept scanning for where I was going to have to go. If, if, it, if everything stopped, I needed to know where I was going to put it. I didn't want to park that in somebody's house. Right. And there was no, you know, there was no damage to anything but the engine, which <laughs> which happened to itself. I mean, the airplane wasn't even damaged, was it? No. no. I, so, <laughs> yeah, like I said, so, my nicer yeah. land. <laughs> that's a, that's a pretty good day when you know when your engine comes apart to that extent and um, and you roll out on the runway. Um, that that's a pretty good day when yeah. to argue about that. But somebody made a comment that uh, they thought it was probably a fault a fault of the casting uh, during the forging. That goes along with what my metallurgist friend had said. Uh, do you have a personal bailout altitude? How high AGL uh, was the flight back? The, I was at two thousand feet. I I. Maintained. I was at 2,000 feet when I came level, basically, from the end of my sequence. I maintained that altitude while I was determining what the hell was going on, and and unfortunately, at 2,000 feet also happens to be the minimum altitude that is listed on my softy chute. So, oh, okay. but you know, again, if if there had been a fire, I would have popped the canopy and jumped. Period. I would have aimed the plane for a field, tried to make sure I didn't throw a flaming meteor at somebody's house, and I would have gotten out. But not being on fire, that was you, the process of deploying the canopy, unbuckling yourself, climbing out of the plane. You're no longer flying the plane at that point. And that plane, aerobatic aircraft are designed to do basically the last thing you told them to do until you tell them to do something different. That's great. However, once you let go of the controls and you're making changes with the canopy and stuff here, I can't help but believe you are going to lose altitude. And maybe a little, maybe a lot. But at that point, I didn't think I had any to afford. So I just kept flying. Yep. Yep. Can't, can't argue with success again. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, the same person that said there was a... Um, probably a problem with the casting, said that um, that person had um, oh, six inches of a prop come off in flight due to a bad casting. Um, yeah, that's, that, that happens. There have been, um, been ends come off props, uh, and that's one of the reasons it's, you have to pre-flight your prop, look for cracks and, and such things. You know, yeah, that's, I noticed somebody else asked if that was an AE. Um, it was not originally an AEIO. Uh, however, the fellow who converted it built a system for inverted oil system and all that it did not have an aerobatic crank which is one of the reasons why that has uh, had and still has an MT propeller so it's a composite wood composite prop which is fairly lightweight which helps the crankshaft on a long six cylinder like that um, it is currently the same propeller but now it's on a, a Titan 540 with 9 to 1 and air cooled induction uh, cold air induction and rollers and ah. oilers and lots of little bells and whistles that the old engine the new engine is absolutely built for aerobatics okay good and the per same person who asked that uh, said uh, what did the engine analyzer show on the way back um, so the uh, on the way back about the only thing I was really paying close attention to was the oil pressure um, that the G the inside G4 does have a uh, an SD card, and so all the analytics were recorded. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't look at them. My mechanic did, uh, but in my mind, there was only once I was on the ground, and uh, you know we were only dealing with a, a broken engine. Um, the decision for me was, am I going to rebuild or replace? And I never gave that a second thought. It was a replace from. <laughs> I wanted to have an engine that, all good, bad, or otherwise, all the time on it was mine, so I, I could account for its entire history. And a new engine is not a guarantee that it won't break, but um, at least I would have. I I know the current engine. I know its entire life. Okay, good. Yeah, and there. Yeah, and there you go. And and you're right. Aerobatic engines they take they take a beating. They're they're not just cross country airplanes for sure. Uh, yeah. somebody, somebody asks, um, did you have to file any paperwork? You said you filed the NASA report. I'm assuming there wasn't anything you had to file other than that. Nope. Nope. And nope. Um, 
Then um, the next, the next one. Did you have to replace your seat cushion? <laughs> no, I just gave it a good, just a good cleaning was all. Good cleaning. There you go. Okay. Uh, okay. So you know, I was, I had a lot better visibility on that flight home because I was sitting up really tall. <laughs> I always say when things like that have happened to me that I didn't need my seatbelt anymore because I had a good grip on the seat cushion. Um, oh, seriously. Yeah. Uh, let's see. How many hours do you have on your new engine and any engine care best practices? Um, the new engine is uh, it, for a variety of different reasons. I have not been getting as many hours in since that incident. Uh, I think I'm around, uh, I'd have to look, but I want to say like I'm around 100 to 150 hours at most on the new engine. And um, best practices, I the engine was um, put on a dyno before it came to me, and I did a, a break-in, you know, just with the standard, the way you break in any brand new engine uh, for a plane, watching RPMs and stuff. Um, unlike a car, they don't want you to um, flex it back and forth. It's pretty much maintain a, a steady RPM. I did not do any inverted flight with it until I was at, I think it was 10 hours or something like that. And otherwise, um, you know, oil's cheap. So yeah. <laughs> the only thing I can say is, you know, make it, it's just if you're going to, especially with an aerobatic engine, but in a plane, period, you, you can't just pull over to the side of the road and, and stop. So, you know, make sure your oil is good. Check when you change your oil. Tear the filter apart. Look for pieces of metal. Do due do diligence to make sure that everything in there is as happy as you can make it. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, we got two more popped up, and I think then we'll call it quits. Um, this one says, I know oil is responsible for some cooling. Wouldn't the oil temp climb before the pressure started to drop? It probably did. Um, the oil pressure, the oil temperatures that I was noticing uh, during the sequence, uh, for example, when number two went up, number two got up to 413 degrees cylinder head temperature. I think my oil temperature, it was a nice cool day, though, happily. It was only about 70 eight degrees out uh, where I was flying, 76 maybe. And I think I want to say that I was well, 180 degrees oil temperature. I don't, I don't think I made it up to 200. Now, once everything, once the case cracked and I'm now I'm, I'm watching oil pressure, I'm not really paying attention to temperature. I wasn't quite that um, relaxed. So it may well have, um, gone up and it may have actually you know it it had to have cracked while i was doing my sequence and while i'm flying a sequence i am totally outside the aircraft i checked in every now and again the g4 has these nice little bars so you've got six bars there and they're either you know the egt is white and the cylinder head temperature is ideally green um i pay attention to if they're one is higher than the other, and if the green isn't green, that gets my attention. And that's about all that I really am looking at uh, until I see something else. You know, I noticed uh, when I came upright, just to kind of put that in perspective, so I rolled upright after the first time through my sequence, and my quick scan showed me that number two was yellow. And then I noticed that that happened to be at 413 degrees. As I'm throttling back, it immediately dropped back down, went green and stayed green as I circled around and got set up for my next time through the box. Um, I checked in a couple of times during the flight uh, just to see, but all at that point all I was looking for was, is it was there anything that wasn't green, you know? Right. Um, and everything, all, all six cylinders were in the green. I'm still okay. We're yeah, green, we're good. Go. Yeah, we're good, and, go. And so then I rolled upright after my last my last figure in the advanced uh, known ends inverted. And so you do your wing wags and I roll upright and that's when I suddenly I'm seeing oil smoke, what turned out to be oil smoke coming up from underneath through my legs. Mm. Wow. 
And um, this one says, uh, did you do any gyroscopic maneuvers before the engine failure? <laughs> yeah, lots. Yeah, <laughs> they're all gyroscopic maneuvers in that point, aren't they? Yeah. So the, I don't remember exactly what the known sequence was, but um, there was at least uh, a double Humpty bump, some spins, several snap rolls. Um, I don't think I had any outside snap rolls, but I had at least two inside. Um, so I'm, you know, uh, a full snap one direction, full roll opposite going into uh, a wedge or a hammerhead or something else. And so, so yeah. Lots of, lots of gyroscopic stuff going on, which there always is in aerobatics. All right, great. Thanks. One, one final one that's a quick one. Are, are aerobatic uh, planes required to carry a black box? I think the answer to that is no, right? They're just general aviation airplanes as well, right? Yes. Okay. Well, well, great. We need to wrap this up, I think, here. I'll get my webcam back out if I can. And um, there we go. And we'll, we're sharing my screen. Yes, good. Okay. Uh, well, we'll get this wrapped up here. Uh, just for quick review and summary, uh, we looked at three kinds of decision making. We looked at some ways in which our unconscious mind can negatively influence our decisions. And we looked at some ways to sharpen our decision making skills. Uh, in case you didn't know, Vemco offers a safety rewards program. Attendees at this event and any other events or those who take any safety-based education courses can receive a percentage off their annual Vemco premium at the time of the quote or the renewal. All you have to do is let Vemco know and they will take care of you. Uh, please visit our, um, our website, vectorsforsafety.com. There are, I don't, shouldn't have that background that's on there. Uh, there are links to videos and to online courses. All but one of the courses is free, and there's a link to a 50% discount on the one that isn't free. You can also join our mailing list to receive the free monthly vectors for safety. I also have some books available. Uh, you can search Amazon for books by Gene Benson, or there are links on my personal website, genebenson.com, to those. And um, Let's close out by saying, uh, please always remember, fly like your life depends on it. So thanks again to Avemco for sponsoring these. Thanks to Lane for sharing his story with us and uh, having low time on his new engine because he assisted with all those daytime webinars in the last month. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to all of you for, uh, for giving up your evening and uh, spending it with, with us. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, fly safe, fly like your life depends on it, and hope to see you online at future events. Bye now.